Hey everybody, what's up? When does God allow a man to lie with the wife of another? That's the question we're going to ask in Strange Fire, which is coming up right now. Hey now, before you forget, be sure to click the subscribe button below, or if you're on our website, uh, sign up for a newsletter. Now here's what Strange Fire is about today. The Mormon Church has recently released the first in a series of books that tell the history of the Mormon Church. I was curious, and so I went to their online source. It's at saints.lds.org. I went there and I opened a, a random chapter and I began to read. It was chapter 36. The, the chapter title is Incline Them to Gather. And so I began to read and, and I read through it. But what interested me most was the closing of the chapter. The last few paragraphs I find very, very interesting and, well, they concern me. So we pick up the story here. It says, quote, Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, Orson Hyde was overcome with emotion as he gazed for the first time on Jerusalem. The ancient city sat atop a hill bordered by valleys and surrounded by thick walls. As he approached the western gate of the city, weary from his travels, Orson caught glimpses of the walls and towers looming behind them. Orson had hoped to enter Jerusalem with John Page, but John had gone home before leaving the United States. Setting off alone, Orson traveled through England and across Europe, passing through some of the continent's great cities. He then headed southeast to Constantinople and caught a steamship to the coastal city of Jaffa. There he arranged to travel to Jerusalem with a company of English gentlemen and their heavily armed servants. Over the next few days, Orson navigated Jerusalem's dusty, uneven streets and met with city's religious and civic leaders. About 10,000 people, mostly Arabic speakers, lived in Jerusalem. The city was in a dilapidated state with parts of it reduced to rubble after centuries of conflict and neglect. Even so, as Orson visited places he had read about in the Bible, he was in awe of the city and its sacred history. When he saw people doing the everyday tasks described in Jesus' parables, he imagined himself transported back to the time of Jesus. In Gethsemane, he plucked a twig from an olive tree and contemplated the atonement. On October 24, 1841, Orson rose before dawn and hiked down a slope near where Jesus had walked the night before his crucifixion. Climbing the Mount of Olives, Orson looked back across the valley at Jerusalem and saw the spectacular Dome of the Rock rising near the site where the temple had stood in the Savior's time. Knowing the Lord had promised that some of Abraham's posterity would be gathered to Jerusalem before the second coming, the apostle sat down and wrote out a prayer, asking God, to lead the scattered remnants to their promised land. And this is what he wrote. Incline them to gather in upon this land according to thy word, Orson prayed. Let them come like clouds and like doves to their windows. When he finished his prayer, Orson made a pile of stones at the site and walked back across the valley to pile more stones on Mount Zion as a simple monument to the completion of his mission. Then he began the long journey home. Is this story true? See, that's the question we need to ask. And, and I'm not going to suggest that what I've just read to you didn't happen. But there is a difference between the truth and a half-truth. There's a difference between the whole truth and the partial truth. There is a difference between presenting some of the facts but hiding others so that people have a skewed view of what really occurred. And that's what we're going to examine today. I'm going to make my comments from this book. It's called In Sacred Loneliness, The Plural Wives of Joseph Smith. It's by Todd Compton. And the point I wanna make about this book is Todd Compton is an active Mormon in good standing. This book has received many awards from LDS historical societies. This book is recognized by the Mormon church as being true. And so there's no agenda here by the writer. And in fact, if there's an agenda at all, it is that the author, Todd Compton, has made excuses where I believe no excuses is valid. But, but still, I have to compliment him. I believe he's done an admirable job 
of presenting the facts as they were. And we're going to take a look at this story. I, I want to begin this story by introducing you to the key players in the story. The first is Joseph Smith, the prophet and the founder of Mormonism. The second is Willard Richards, one of Joseph's apostles. The third is Sidney Rigdon, also an apostle. The fourth is a man by the name of Ebenezer Robinson. Now, Ebenezer Robinson uh, ran Times and Seasons. That was a Mormon newspaper in Nauvoo. That was his livelihood. That's what he did for a living. I also want to introduce you to Orson Hyde, who you have seen or heard a little bit of, and his wife, Mirinda. The key player, and the player I want to focus on the most, is the modern-day Mormon leadership. So let's begin here. We pick up the story as Orson Hyde is called on his mission to Jerusalem. And he wrote in his own journal, I was appointed in company with Elder John E. Page to go on a mission to Jerusalem. It goes on and the book reads, On October 24, 1841, he stood on the Mount of Olives and consecrated Palestine for the gathering of Judah in the last days. And then he began his trip home, as we have already read and discussed from the book, The Saints. On his way home, he wrote a letter to his wife, and I quote, My dear Mirinda, may the Lord bless you and save you from the violence of men and from all evil. Your kind respects to the presidency and all that inquire after me. I am, as ever, your affectionate husband, Orson Hyde. I want to point out one, one, one thing here that I think is very, very important. He says, my kind respects to the presidency. When he's talking about the presidency, he's talking about Joseph Smith and the other apostles who he holds to be apostles of God, who he expects will do the right thing. While Orson was on his mission, Joseph Smith had a revelation from God and this is what I would like to read. I, actually, before I read the Revelation, uh, Mirinda was really struggling. She had two small daughters. She didn't have enough food to eat. She wasn't able to care for herself or her daughters. And so Joseph Smith had this revelation. And this is what it said. It says, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant Joseph, that inasmuch as you have called upon me to know my will concerning my handmaid, Nancy Mirinda Hyde, Behold, it is my will that she should have a better place prepared for her than that in which she now lives, in order that her life may be spared unto her. Therefore go and say unto my servant Ebenezer Robinson, and to my handmaid his wife, let them open their doors and take her and her children into their house and take care of them faithfully and kindly until my servant Orson Hyde returns from his mission. And let my handmaid, Nancy Mirinda Hyde, hearken to the counsel of my servant Joseph. In all things whatsoever he shall teach unto her, and, and it shall be a blessing unto her and upon her children after her unto her justification, saith the Lord. Now, the, the thing I want to point out here is this revelation. Joseph is actually saying that God has said specifically to Mirinda, Hearken to everything Joseph will teach you and do as he tells you. And it will be a blessing to your salvation and to the salvation of your children. Next up, we see a change in the household of Ebenezer Robinson. Remember, he is running Times and Seasons, the Mormon newspaper. Joseph received another revelation in which he declared that the 12 apostles are to take over the newspaper and that Ebenezer Robinson is to lose his home, his property, the tools and implements of his trade, and his livelihood. And so this revelation was given and, and Ebenezer Robinson was told to vacate immediately. It's interesting what he wrote after he left his home. He wrote, now this is again, this is Ebenezer Robinson, he wrote that evening, Willard Richard fired off his revolver in the street after dark and commenced living with Mrs. Nancy Mirinda Hyde in the rooms we had vacated in the printing office building. Where they lived through the winter, his family was residing at that time in Massachusetts, and Elder Orson Hyde was absent on his mission to Palestine. 
So here we have one man, one woman living together in Nauvoo, Illinois. Now, it may be easy to disregard the words of Ebenezer Robinson because he's just been evicted from his home, he's just lost his livelihood. He might be frustrated. And so we turn to the words of Sidney Rigdon, another apostle of Joseph Smith the prophet, and he wrote, if Richards should take a notion to Hyde's wife in his absence, all that is necessary to be done is to be sealed, no harm done, no adultery committed, only taking a little advantage of rights of priesthood. And after Richards has gone the round of dissipation with Hiram's wife, she is afterwards turned over to Smith. And thus the poor silly woman becomes the actual dupe of two designing men under the sanctimonious garb of the rights of the royal priesthood. So after Willard Richards lived with Miranda for a time, she was married to Joseph Smith. This is documented in many places, but perhaps the most compelling is in Joseph Smith's own journal. It says, April 42, Miranda Johnson to Joseph Smith. Now when Orson Hyde returned home from his, from his mission, we've, we've heard the letter already that he wrote to his wife. He loved her. He returned home and he found that his wife was living and married to Joseph Smith. He wasn't very happy. And in, in this book, the author wrote, theoretically, the second husband may have encouraged the first husband to take other wives to compensate for the loss of the first wife, to help them start their own eternal kingdom. Isn't this interesting that, that evidence shows, and there's many occasions where evidence points to this, that Joseph Smith would take the wife of another man and then soothe the ruffled feathers of, of the first husband by saying, hey, it, it's not a problem. I will give you more wives, more women for your own harem, I guess. I don't know. Now, in closing, there's one thing that I want to point out. The church marries people in some crazy and different ways. They are married for time only. Now, for time only, that means that they're married in this life. They're married while they are mortal before their deaths. And if they are married for time only, then that involves sexual relations. And so the church often points to Joseph Smith and they said he was only married for eternity, meaning that he would become the, the husband of these women eternally after death. And so there would be no sexual relations while they live. But it's very, very interesting because <laughs> in 1846, Miranda was sealed to Orson Hyde. You see, a woman can only be sealed to one man. And, and if they're sealed, that is the eternal sealing. That's the eternal marriage. And so Miranda was given, she was sealed to Orson Hyde for all of eternity. Now, if she was sealed to Hyde for eternity, then her marriage to Smith could not be for eternity because she can only be sealed to one man. Therefore, therefore, She was married to Joseph Smith for time only, which would include sexual relations. The question is very simple. Is this strange fire? Strange fire is when we start doing things that are not approved by God, and we do that in the name of God. We do that in the name of religion. You see, we have the Ten Commandments. You should not covet your neighbor's wife. We have Leviticus, which states clearly that if a man lies with the wife of another man, that the penalty for both is death. So this is the gospel that God has given us. You shall not take the wife of another man. If you lie with the wife of another man, you and her will be put to death. This is the gospel. And so we measure. How do we measure to see if there is in fact strange fire? God has given us ways to measure these things. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses one through five. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams does things that actually look like a real prophet. I mean, you see him even work wonders and miracles. You go, wow, it's got to be true. He's got to be a prophet. But if he leads you after other gods, after other gospels, then he has to be put to death. You see, the gospel is that a man must honor another man's wife and, and, and keep his hands off. Joseph said, no, I'm, I, I, that doesn't apply to me. We turn to Galatians chapter 1. 
Then it says, even if we or an angel from heaven should come to you and lead you to a gospel other than the one you've already received, anathema, you must be cursed. It's God's eternal cursing. That's strange fire. That is strange fire. And it's, it's interesting that, that my focus isn't on the strange fire of Joseph Smith, even though it's real and it's documented. My concern is that the strange fire kindled by Smith is still being maintained by the Mormon church. They will tell you the parts of the story that are warm and fuzzy, but they will not tell you the whole story. They continue to cover up and hide and support Joseph Smith in his activities, which are documented as strange fire. The church continues to kindle the fire that was started by Joseph Smith. And this makes them this makes them supporters of strange fire, supporters of evil, supporters of the unspeakable. And again, the passages that tell us how to discover if a man is involved in strange fire teach us that according to Galatians, it's God's worst cursing. According to Leviticus, he must be put to death. Yeah, this is strange fire. <laughs>